We're glad you could join us today to hear about True Use Case AI for Call Center using Amazon Connect. We're excited not only to share the journey and the solutions for cloud-based call center solution, but to share the roadmap, results, challenges, so that you um, can move to the cloud and be faster and complete the project with more clarity. My name is Michelle Chung, and I'm the director of True, a public-private partnership with a mission to increase tech-enabled jobs in Hawaii. We all face similar problems. How can my workforce securely work remotely? How do I engage customers during the pandemic? How can I leverage technology in a better way? True aims to support organizations in Hawaii by sharing solutions to common business problems, like the one you're going to see today, with the intent to help accelerate the adoption of technology and innovation. We hope this will support other organizations in solving similar problems. CHU is an initiative of the Hawaii Executive Collaborative. If you're interested to learn how you or your organization can be part of CHU, please visit us at hec.org slash CHU. I'd like to thank the other organizations who helped bring you these events. The first is HCDC, Hawaii Technology Development Corporation. They're a state agency attached to DBED, Department of Business Economic Development and Tourism. Their mandate is to grow the tech economy and workforce here in Hawaii which is closely aligned with TRUE. The second is the Entrepreneur Sandbox. They're a co-working facility in Kaka'ako owned by HDDC and managed by Box Jelly. It's Hawaii's front door to innovation where we stand up technology, showcase it, and provide an open space for collaboration. If you haven't seen it yet, I hope you can come by when the lockdown lifts. On the menu for today, we have a fireside chat on AI for Call Center and a brief demo followed by other Amazon Connect and AWS use cases to show different solutions on the island. And then we'll close with Q&A. Before we begin, let me share a couple of housekeeping items. The session will be recorded and please feel free to send in your questions during the session through the Q&A function. We'll address them at the end of the webinar. If the Q&A goes long, please do submit your questions and we'll do our best to get you the answers after the event. As we face the pandemic, we're faced with difficult decisions of how to maintain operations, earn a livelihood, and staying safe. Everyone talks about the new normal, but we're not there yet in the world. And the way we do things is changing right before our eyes. Much of the change is enabled by technology, and we're all still learning and adjusting. Today, we get to see how Central Pacific Bank has digitally transformed their call center to meet the needs of a dispersed workforce, increased call volume, and demanding customer service by moving to the cloud. It's weird that we have a fireside chat with everyone so far apart, but we're together digitally and in spirit. Whoops, sorry. Please join me in welcoming our speakers today. Adrian Chi is the SVP and Division Head of Information Technology at Central Pacific Bank. Innovation means imagining something new, a fresh idea that hasn't been done before. The same concept applies to banking with over 30 years of experience in banking technology. Adrian is a key team member helping to drive innovation at CPB. Adrian has experience in managing complex technology projects, strategic implementations. In 2019, Adrian led the innovation and transformation of the bank's collaboration platform, introducing new ways of working for the CBP employees. Adrian's deeply rooted in Hawaii and is no stranger to hard work helping on the family farm in Kona, where she still travels every harvest season to lend a hand. She earned a Bachelor's of Science degree from HPU and serves on the board for Junior Achievement of Hawaii. I'd also like to welcome Chris Jones. He's a Technical Project Manager at Aspen Technology Group based out of Colorado. Chris has worked for more than 20 years in the contact center space. He started out working for outsourcing call centers in San Diego and Buffalo, during the late 1900s, uh, 1990s, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Supporting <laughs> voice technology platforms for inbound telesales and customer service, along with outbound programs for financial institutions. I promise it wasn't enough. It was just a misread. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> After working in the outsourcing industry, Chris moved to the dot-com world and landed with ProFlowers under the Provide Commerce umbrella 
Chris managed both the domestic call center platforms and routing domestic outsourced call centers for multiple brands, including Pro Flowers, Sherry Berries, Sherry Moon Farms, at peak periods, Provide Commerce would answer close to 2 million calls within three weeks. Chris is now with Aspen Technology Group, a consultancy that focuses on providing the best customer experience. Thank you both for sharing and for prepping some slides because a picture is worth a thousand words. I'd like to turn it over to you guys. Thank you, Michelle. That was a great introduction. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here and to present uh, Amazon Connect along with Adrian. Yes, thank you, Michelle. Thank you for having both of us share um, this, you know, great project that we're working on. So thank you. So we'll kick this off, uh, Adrian, that you've been working uh, on digi digitizing your contact center. What is AI for your contact center? What does it mean to you and your and CPB? Yeah. Yeah, so Chris, thank you. Great, great starting question. So, you know, for me, AI for call center really means uh, leveraging the innovative benefits of artificial intelligence, robotics, and um, machine learning, um, and automation to drive faster, more consistent service, while delivering higher customer satisfaction and expectations, right? Um, improving the, the platform and the call center um, experience um, with innovation um, to help create possibilities for enhancing products and services and automating routine tasks and, and even helping, you know, with um, improving or, or making this, you know, just pure decision making, really. So how did you get started on this? What got you going and pointing in this direction? Yeah, so, um, you know, it's always been an initiative of the bank to improve our contact center platform. Um, you know, our current platform is old. It's um, it's, it's seen its years and, you know, it really is functions more like a traditional uh, PBS. And so we're looking and we've been having discussions around moving to an omni-channel solution, something that will, you know, improve our customer engagement and, and our experience. Um, and, you know, fortunately through True and the True Initiative, CPB volunteered to lead um, this specific use case, AI for Call Center. Uh, you know, and purely because, you know, we believe that it's our way to contribute and our social responsibility, really, to contribute to ideas and uh, solutions um, that can help benefit all organizations in Hawaii, not just, not just the bank. And so when we took on this, um, you know, when we took on and we volunteered to take on this use case, um, you know, with the help of our human resources department, we opened up a um, summer internship program. Uh, partnering with local universities and colleges um, to work on this specific use case. And so part of that was hiring four interns and we, you know, they spent the summer with us last summer. Um, and they, you know, from Chaminade, University of Hawaii, um, uh, you, you know, um, uh, and some of the community, a couple of the community colleges, Honolulu Community College, Kapiolani Community College. And so they spent the summer with us and, um, you know, when they first came on board, they actually had no idea what a contact center was, what, what they did. And so we put them uh, into, actually served as actual agents in our internal help desk support. And really that was about learning, you know, what are the pain points? What does it do? And what problem were they there to solve? And and they did a great job, you know, so they spent a month uh, serving as an agent and then went into design thinking and from there spent countless hours doing research and talking to tech companies just to gather data. And, um, you know, it was, it was enjoyable to work with them as much as, you know, I think they had fun as well. We both learned from each other. Um, but they contacted over 50 different solutions providers in the AI for call center space. Uh, including the big ones, you know, Amazon, obviously, and then Google, Microsoft, IBM, Apple, um, and, you know, they just gathered a lot of data and they did a phenomenal job. That's actually a pretty cool summer to spend <laughs> in college working <laughs> with all those big companies and in a bank. So I think it's kind of neat. Yeah. What, business, what list of business problems did you give them that you were trying to solve by looking at these different uh, companies? Yeah, so, you know, um, 
there, there were there were many business problems, of course, that we, you know, of course, had to group them into um, into different buckets. But you know, off the top of my head, the bigger ones for us to solve, um, you know, was pretty um, agent mobility, being able to, um, you know, have our workforce um, be able to work from remote locations and even from home. Um, today, we're tied in the office because of the current platform that we're on. You know, um, the lack of being able to just gather simple customer satisfaction metrics automatically. Today, that's manual. We get to pick and choose, um, you know, what customers we want to survey. Um, staffing stability is an issue and a problem that we need to solve. Uh, and then just keeping up with the increasing customer expectations. Uh, and then, um, you know, our platforms, our integration, um, integration into all the different IT platforms today. Our agents spend a lot of time toggling from one system and one application to the other. And, and that's tough, you know, they've got to spend all of their time, um, you know, tending to customer calls and they're not able to spend time selling. And, you know, a lot of it has to do with how our, um, our platforms are just not integrated. Well, it's definitely a lot of problems to solve. What kind of goals <laughs> did you create for this project that you were actually looking to, to, to reach as part of doing this? Yeah, um, besides everything, um, let's see, you know, that, that was a tough one because we, we sat there when we talked a lot about, you know, what were our goals, what were we going to do? And so what we came up with, and Michelle, if you can bring up the next slide, um, you know, working with the interns, this is how we, we actually compartmentalize the entire journey um, to make it into a simple, much more, um, you know, a much simpler picture. And so what we pulled together was really four different components or phases, if you will. And the first one is customer effort. And what customer effort is, it is about the agent. It is about our people, the ones that have to work in the, in the contact center, the ones that are on the front line, the ones that are actually doing the work with our, our customers. And so um, the customer effort is about, you know, what are their tools? What do they use? What are the challenges they're having? You know, how can we make their experience great so that they can deliver that same feeling to our external customers? I call this the meat phase, the, the part where we have to get it right. Um, that's where all the heavy lifting occurs. And, you know, and if we can get it right in customer effort and make that customer effort seamless, make it as smooth as possible by the introduction of AI, we think we can then achieve better customer satisfaction metrics. We can get the, the the uh, metrics that we're looking for, we can get a good read on how we're doing in terms of our entire experience. And, you know, from there, flow into changing our contact center, which is an important channel for the bank. Um, you know, they have so many touch points with so many of our customers. Well, we need to use that as a leverage to, to cross sell. So, you know, um, getting to, you know, by doing all of these phases, we can eventually get them to back into selling and helping to grow the business. And then finally, you know, our ultimate goal, which is omni-channel, building, bringing everything together to provide a simple, clean, um, and, you know, uh, seamless experience for our agents, between our agents and our customers. Back to you, Chris. Thank you. Okay. All right. So with all those goals, I mean, there's a lot here that you definitely have to, uh, to measure and, and make sure it lined up with your business needs. Why did Amazon Connect fit that? Well, what was special about that? Yeah, you know, um, so, so I'm going to give you some of the points that, uh, you know, that resonated for me. And, and this was all through the, the, the research and, and efforts of our interns. And, um, you know, the first thing was that Amazon Connect was a cloud hosted solution. And, you know, at the bank, you know, our technology strategy has been um, cloud, cloud first, or we don't have the internal resources to manage everything. Um, and, you know, certainly our core competency is banking and, um, you know, not software and development. And so, um, you know, cloud hosted solution, that was great. It, it struck home very quickly. Um, secondly, and I think this was, this was a big deal for, for me, um, it was free, uh, you know, no contract commitment or contract required to get started. And, and let me tell you, Chris, I asked this question five, six, maybe seven times. I can't even tell you how many times I asked this question because I had to make sure that free meant it was really free. And so, um, you know, but, but it turned out it was, it was no track contract commitment. And I just thought, wow, you know, that was great. Um, the 
fact that it was easy and fast to deploy, and we learned that through um, the Amazon, um, you know, events that was hosted here in Hawaii. Um, and, you know, it came with the AI components. AI, robotics, machine learning capabilities was all a part of the solution. And, you know, um, part of taking a look at any system that we bring in, it's important that the platform that we're, or software that we're choosing to, to go with works with our own banking platforms. We are, vir I mean, you know, about 80 to 90 percent virtual. Um, our network in, in the bank is virtual, and, and then also we do a lot of remote connectivity. So it has, I had to make sure that it can operate based on our network environment. And, and then it had to support omnichannel, and, and it did through all of our research. Um, you know, one of the big things about Amazon Connect is that it can deliver an omnichannel um, you know, experience. And, you know, um, and that was, that was all of the, the data that we collected and that's how we got to, you know, our, our checklist and our check marks and said, yeah, you know, this is a good fit. And, you know, fast forward to today, I'm glad that we stuck to that decision. Um, you know, Synergy Research Group just um, put out a, a survey um, and has shown that Amazon is a leader in the $100 billion cloud market um, as of second quarter 2020. And so, you know, it's exciting to see that, you know, the decision, the choices that we made is being supported, you know, even, um, you know, across the, the tech market. And um, so that's pretty exciting. And, you know, Chris, just one more fun note I, that I wanted to mention, um, you know, we talked about our, our interns and, um, you know, I wanted to, to mention that we hired, um, we actually hired one of our, one of the summer interns and she is a full-time person with us today. Um, working in our IT support help desk as an agent and where she actively and continuously contributes to um, the success of this project. So we're, we're pretty proud of that. That's actually really cool. She gets to see the, the part of the decision she was part of actually now in action, yeah. in deployment, everything. You did mention Amazon is the leader uh, as of Q2 of this year in the cloud, uh, right. in the cloud market. They have 33% of the, the business and Azure is uh, their second place with 18%. So they definitely are the leader in what people oh, are that's definitely quite a gap. moving to. Yeah, it's pretty big. Yeah, yeah it's yes. a pretty good lead, wow, yeah. You mentioned the ease of deployment and one of the things obviously I think is great, the, the lack of uh, a need for a contract. It's one of the things that I know licensing, uh, maintenance that you always have to pay for in the traditional PBX Absolutely. world is, is crazy. Um, Outside of that, what, how did you see the ease of deployment? What made it so simple for you? So, yeah, you know, um, when we first, uh, w once we signed up for our subscription with Amazon and said, yes, you know, we're gonna do this, I was pretty surprised that our test instance literally took just two days to stand up. And, and what I mean by that, in two days, we were actually picking up calls on the Amazon Connect test instance. And these were live calls because we could forward the calls through, through um, our test instance and actually take agent calls and service our customers. And so what does that mean? What does that mean? We had, you know, a working number through Amazon Connect. We had Poly AI text-to-speech enabled. Um, and we had call recording. And so, you know, those were really the three main minimum um, features that you needed to get running in a call flow. And, you know, again, two days, I couldn't believe how quick and simple that was. Um, and then, you know, today we're doing actual production deployments. We are deploying the technology to several um, support areas across the bank. And, you know, it takes us literally four to five days to, to enable and deploy and get um, a support area up and running. And, you know, part of that four to five days includes you know, engaging with the business owner and making sure we understand their operations and we understand their business. Um, you know, mapping out their customer journey and then, you know, diagramming the call flow, setting up the users, going through UAT, providing user training, and then finally getting them into production. And so, you know, that's, that's a pretty short time frame to get a full operating contact center going. And um, I, I'm pretty impressed with that. And, you know, and part of that is, um, 
part of that deployment, that ease of deployment, for us, what makes it even easier is that, you know, we've partnered, we've decided to partner with uh, an Amazon solutions integrator called, you know, Aspen Technology, Chris, from, you know, which is where you're from. And so you've been intimately involved in our project, and I, I thank you for all the work and helping getting us to this point. And, um, you know, but that, you know, you don't have to go with a solutions integrator. Amazon Connect, you can also, um, you know, manage the deployment and manage the system in-house if you have your own resources as well. And so, Michelle, you know, if you can bring up the next slide, what I wanted to share as part of the deployment um, is, you know, just some, some quick pictures around, um, you know, I mentioned customer journey mapping and some call flow diagram, and I just wanted to give you a hint of some of the work that we did um, with the interns. And so this is a customer journey map of um, our help desk support um, call center. And, you know, what's nice about doing the customer journey map is one, you kind of see what you put your customers through when they're making a phone call. But more importantly, you see what your agents have to deal with. And if you can see in this, in this um, picture here, and, you know, Michelle can just kind of slide, this is just one of three pages. But um, any picture here that you see um, that looks like a cup is the best way that I can describe it. That signifies that that's a manual process. And as you go through, as Michelle's flipping through these diagrams, you can see that there's a lot of cups in there. And so, you know, we've got, you know, when we looked at that, we said, wow, we've got a lot of work to do to help um, improve the experience for our agents and make their jobs more efficient. And so, um, you know, the customer journey map was just, was just very insightful for us. And so once we get the customer journey maps done, um, we move into, and what Michelle is showing there is what we call, um, you know, the call flow. And uh, this is a simple call flow of our uh, IT support help desk. And we take this picture, so we take the journey map, we condense it down into this technical picture, which is really just a con concept. It's a conceptual diagram of how we want the flows um, the call flows to, to occur. So this is the picture we gave over to you, Chris, um, at Amazon. And on the next slide um, is just a glimpse of how it gets translated into Amazon Connect. Um, and you know, what I wanted to point out here is there's a common theme when using Amazon Connect and everything is all flow charting. You know, we've been using flow charts have been um, the tool for us in this entire journey. And, you know, Michelle mentioned earlier, picture is worth a thousand words. And um, yeah, and in, in this case, and with this project, pictures are everything, uh, you know, it just gives you um, a clear view of where you are, where you wanna go, and how do we get there? I think one of the things you're talking That's about, ease of deployment, uh, we also, Amazon and uh, Aspen, you put on what we call boot camps, where you can come and see it, you know, see an introduction as to what the application can do for you and actually work on a, a little use case for your own. Like we can walk you through actually building out how a call center would look and building out some small parts of it. So you can actually get a feel for the application, not just the contact flow, but other parts that go along with it. Um, you know, lambdas, data dips, all sorts of backend things that you can do to enhance the, uh, right. the availability of, data getting to your agents. That's definitely something yeah, we can do. You know, with all the work definitely. you've done, you've, you've, you know, I like how you brought the interns in, that was great, and how you uh, got, the, got them trained on how to be call center agents, and then set them free. You gave them the list of problems to solve, and all these quick deployments. What is the state of the project at this point? Yeah, so, Michelle, you can bring up um, the next slide. Um, you know, we took the roadmap that, that we presented, or, you know, the, the goals map, if you will, um, and we mapped it into this roadmap and into different phases. And so, um, you know, we've gone through our design thinking, and that was with our interns and, you know, our original uh, um, research. And, you know, we've mapped it into phases. And so, um, Michelle, if you can flip to the next slide, please. Um, so, and so the, on this next slide, if you look at this blue bubble, you know, I talked about the customer effort and making sure that, you know, we get everything right. And we are still in the customer effort phase. We are still working with deployments. We are still bringing on more um, operational areas and support areas into this call center um, solution. 
And so, um, yeah, you know, we're still doing a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of heavy work here in the, in the customer effort um, phase. And, you know, I, if I had to guess, I would say we would probably be in this phase um, a good part of the rest of the year, if not maybe into January 2021. So we've covered all the, the kind of the area from your research up to where uh, deployment, your state of it, the state of the, the project at this point. What advice would you give yep. to anyone who's starting to look into AI and specifically a cloud solution compared to uh, the traditional approach to call center, contact centers? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you, Chris. Um, you know, um, when you get into AI, and I have to tell you, you know, getting for, for myself last year was the most that I've ever dug into AI. I've read about AI. I've heard about it. I've, you know, uh, participated in webinars about AI, but I really didn't know what AI meant. Um, and so I had to do a lot of research myself and a lot of understanding and talking story with people. And, you know, um, the first advice that I can that I can offer for any organization is, you know, first and foremost, have a clear understanding of the role of AI that AI will play in your organization's customer experience, journey, and strategy. It is so important, right? For us, AI um, and the introduction of AI and robotics and machine learning is, is more about making enhancements to our existing strategy and not renovating it. So, um, you know, that's first and foremost, understand the role of AI. How is it going to um, be introduced into your organization? What goals are you trying to hit and how can AI help you, help you meet those goals? Um, you know, and secondly, um, you know, we decided to partner with a, with a third party integrator, you know, Chris, with, with your company. And so it is important to make sure, first and foremost, that your goals, your requirements, your timeline, everything that you're expecting to get done is well documented, well organized, and most importantly, clearly communicated to your provider um, or your partner. And, and make sure that your partner, um, your solutions um, partner, clearly understands all of those requirements, all of the objectives that you're trying to accomplish, and, and your expectations. You know, um, and then the reason why I say this is so important, um, it, it can really make a difference on how well your project is is implemented and and the amount of you know the amount of bumps and bruises that you experience along the way and Chris I see you smiling and I know why you're smiling and you've been a part of this and so I'm, I'm going to give an example you know we we spent time building out um, the very first call flow and we were so excited and so happy and we were almost to the end and I want to say we were there about you know 90 99 percent ready to go and then I introduced to Chris and I said, hey, Chris, I got to enable SSO, right? And Chris, your face was priceless. <laughs> and, and for me, scary, because I didn't know what to, to think about that. But, you know, you had this face like, oh, my God, I cannot believe you're telling me this now. And, um, you know, the, the, the end of the story, you know, the, the, to shorten the story on that is that we did have to rebuild. We did have to start again. But, you know, the beauty, and we talked about the ease of Amazon Connect, Chris was able to duplicate a lot of the work um, while Aspen worked on getting SSO implemented before we deployed. It was absolutely critical that SSO be deployed before getting it out into production. So, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a story that <laughs> I can say how important it is to make sure that you have all of your requirements um, clearly documented. But uh, that then, one definitely you know, was a gotcha. And I should have known you were going to bring it up. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Chris, I had to. <laughs> oh, it I was, but, <laughs> but, you know, obviously I think anything can be overcome. And with the ease of Connect, yeah. you know, I think we did get into a, a, a quick deployment. And that definitely was something that we both should have caught. And definitely it was a learning experience. Yeah. But those are all things that uh, they can be gotchas, uh, making sure that we could, moving forward, go over all the details for every project, even the small parts, things you don't think are a big issue to make sure you don't have any surprises like that. Absolutely. And, you know, and I think just going through this journey, 
um, and this partnership, there is a lot of lessons learned that we've, we already have up to this point, even though we're in the project's not done yet. And, you know, I think that's going to be important and that's critical and, and valuable to offer to other organizations as well that, you know, are thinking about getting into um, joining the, the Amazon um, ecosystem. And, you know, with that, you know, if anyone, you know, if you're interested or anyone is interested in help in growing the Amazon ecosystem, you know, here in Hawaii, you know, reach out to True through Michelle Chung um, or myself at CPB and we would definitely, you know, love to get together with you and talk story and see how we can help um, anyone uh, or any organization um, to get started. And, you know, Chris, any other advice that, you know, maybe I didn't touch on that you think would be valuable? No, I really think that the having, well, good communication with your partner is definitely important. I think you and I communicated Absolutely. well and it made getting past that little bump not that big of an issue. Um, that and obviously making sure the details are covered, I think that is key. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely good points. Good points. Communication was was and will always be key to making sure um, that it's successful. Any project is successful. Yes. Yeah. So, hey, Chris, I thought, you know, at this point, um, I think this would be a great time to kind of jump in and show our viewers um, a little bit of the Amazon Connect um, and AI capabilities. How does that sound? Okay, I can do that. So what we're gonna go over here is very, very basic. It's not gonna be anything in depth. It's just gonna show the ease of deployment um, and how quick you can make, uh, lay things out and get things done. So first, there we go. So everything is done. As you recall, the slide that was brought up earlier that showed the how Adrian presented to us the, the contact flow, how she wanted to call the flow, where the options would be. And she had arrows on it showing where a call would start and where it would end up. Well, in the Amazon world, we actually do it like that with blocks. Every uh, contact flow, the call will come in and have an entry point. And that entry point will start going through these blocks. They're just connected by lines. And the lines are very simple to connect. Um, all you do is draw a line and you connect it. It's that simple to go the direction of your flow. So we set up things like call uh, logging so that you can actually trace a call if that's what you need to do. Uh, and then you set up things like call recording and analytics. Now, if you've worked in a traditional call center in the past, that is something that, uh, you know, setting up call recording takes uh, requirements gathering, uh, engineering, how many uh, contacts you need to actually record, um, how long you need to store them for. And if you were to add analytics to it, that is another uh, completely different uh, project. It's gonna encompass servers you have to have on site, things you have to maintain, maintenance, licensing. So it's a big ordeal and it would take at least weeks to do that if it was done quickly. What we do is from this menu on the left side where it says set recording and analytics behavior, we just drag this over. And I'm just gonna lay it on top of this so it won't be really in, in production. And you see it says enable uh, none. So we're not doing anything with the recording. You just click on this box here on the top and call recording is turned off. It's as simple as turning it on and selecting who you're gonna record. We're gonna choose to record the agent and the customer. Um, then we're also gonna turn on uh, contact lens, which is speech analytics. Uh, it's a great tool, it allows you to actually look at sentiment of the call. The, call, uh, the system will interpret, you know, by the way the, the agent and the customer or the caller are communicating how the call is going. So you just enable that and it's already set for the English language and you would hit save. You've now turned on analytics and you enable call recording. It's that simple. Uh, when you actually have a call that's recorded, I can actually show you how the analytics looks. Um, you go to something called a contact trace record, a CTR. Uh, it gives you basic information about the call, the unique contact ID that follows the call all through um, anything time it's in connect. So it's a traceable call. Tells you the type of call it was, when it started, when it ended, how long the, the entire contact lasted, the phone number, who answered it, and what queue it went to. Then it goes over here, and this box here will tell you the sentiment of the call. You know, zero is going to be neutral. So in the very beginning, it interpreted the call as being not quite uh, neutral. And as the call progressed, it went down a little bit. Uh, was maybe some things weren't going as smooth as you want it to be, but the call overall ended in a positive note. So you can see. Hey, Chris, the call 
Yeah. Sorry, I'm just going to jump in here real quick. I just wanted to mention, and so what we're looking at right now, this is an actual live call, right? This is something from our production system that happened. Yes. It is right? a call this from is not, September 2nd, is, yeah. This, okay, so this is our system. So, wow, so this looks like it was a pretty good call. Yes. I mean, so it was neutral for 63% of the call, uh, positive yeah. for nearly 20%. And there's some negative things in there that were 13%. And you can look through the transcript of the call and see why the, the, it was scored this way. Another sure. important piece over here, talk time. So the total talk time of this call was just over 11 minutes. And what's important about this is it actually will tell you non-talk time, which while this might not seem like a big factor, but if you have uh, backend systems that are making your agents unproductive, you can start looking at, well, why did I have a non-talk time? What was going on? Can right. we improve that? So there's lots of areas you can actually look and see uh, where you can make enhancements, not just on the agent performance, but your own systems performance. Right. So we can see here the agent talked for 48% and the, uh, sorry, sorry, the customer spoke for about 48% and the agent nearly 51%. So it's a, a very equal call. When the calls are recorded, uh, it actually records in stereo. So when you do a playback, uh, the customer will be in one speaker or one ear and the uh, agent will be in the other. So you can, when you're listening, if people are talking over each other, you can actually tell who was talking by just knowing what speaker it's coming out of. And then going down to the uh, actual transcript of the call, it actually uh, can actually wow, transcribe the call. Yeah. Yep. The accuracy of this is going to be about 80%. It's not going to be perfect, but uh, I think the, there's common words that uh, may be misspoken or the dialect or an accent. Sometimes it's a little uh, not as good, but the overall you'll get 80% of uh, accuracy here. You look on the right side when uh, the agent answered, it was uh, neutral. Didn't really give it a positive or negative. Um, and that followed in through the hellos. And then uh, I guess there's a problem being heard and the customer said, yeah, I can hear you now, which was read as a, a favorable comment. So that's how you can scroll through and see where the sentiment is coming from, how it's being interpreted by the system to tr drill down and look at what was happening around a uh, positive or negative um, interpretation. Oh, here's a sad face. There's the three icons you have to worry about. You have the sad, yeah, the, the red sad face. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Adrian. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say the transcript in this one looks pretty good. I, I'm I'm surprised with the you know how well it captured all of the uh, the text um, from through the language. And just to be honest, I didn't even search for that. This just happened to be a good one we grabbed. So <laughs> that's a good oh, one. Oh really? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, you did a good but, job. <laughs> perfect. So you can scroll through and see uh, you know where you want to look at the transcript. Uh, for different parts of the call, if that's what you want to. You can see how long they spoke during different parts. So it's a great tool. And again, this was enabled uh, very, very quickly. Uh, didn't take long at all. Just like in your call center, when you decided to go with the analytics and it became available because it is a new product, we had it up and running uh, same day. Yep, same so, day. So to go, we took one so, day to bring that, that in. So to go through here, um, we use these blocks to set up different parts of the uh, of the call. Uh, the call behavior as it goes through the, the, the flow. And one of the things you see here is set voice. This is how we set the voice that the caller will hear when they're hearing prompts um, or anything where the, the system is interacting with the customer and, and speaking to them. You know, usually you have to write a script, send it out to a talent, they record it, they send it back to you, right. upload it to your switch. And that takes time. If you want to make a change, those changes, you have to go through the whole process again. So it's definitely time consuming and a little more expensive. So we use right. something here uh, at Amazon called Polly. And Polly is great because you can actually type in whatever you want. And I had this already copied and pasted in there. And we have these different voices. You can listen to male or female voices. Um, and. Isn't this great? I'm looking forward to using this solution in my organization. And we can qu just as quickly change it to a male voice. Isn't this great? I'm looking forward to using this solution in my organization. Now, it did sound a little uh, robotic, but there are things called SSML tagging where you can actually use commands to uh, enunciate certain words and make changes to how it reads to make it sound a little bit better. Um, and you're not stuck with just English. If you're an international company, you can actually have it, and we have the same phrase or a similar phrase available in Japanese. 
、素晴らしいですね。弊社に最適なソリューションだと思います。素晴らしいですね。弊社に最適なソリューションだと思います。So makes, uh, uh, はい。That, that was very、uh, insightful for you know, our viewers. Thank you. And we can, if and, we want to do a demo for anyone later on, we can actually go a lot deeper and talk about the different things you can put on,、uh, all the features, you know, the lambdas, all the different ways you can enhance、uh, your, the caller experience. Yeah,、so. that's, that's great. Thank you, Chris. Thank、yep. you. Hey, thank you, Adrian、so, and Chris. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> Sorry, thank you for sharing. How much things have changed since the 1900s? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Chris, you age very well. <laughs> <laughs> and for being so honest and open and sharing the good, the bad, and the funny. <laughs> thank you. For the next guest, I would like to invite Scott. <laughs> Um, Amazon Connect is only one component of Amazon Solution Set. Next, I'd like to introduce Scott Fujieda、um, to share other use cases that he sees on the island, both with Amazon Connect and with AWS. Scott is Vice President of Solutions and Services at Data House, a local consulting firm that's been delivering world class solutions to customers for over 40 years. Scott's been with Data House for 17 years. To help guide and support organizations through their digital transformation journey, establishing innovative programs that can lead to new growth opportunities. He's a great deal of alignment with the True Initiative as well, establishing Hawaii as a leader in innovation in a way that will benefit both our economy and our community. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Michelle. And I'm very happy to be here. Thanks for allowing me to join you, Adrian and Chris. So, what I'd like to do is just share some of our own experience、um, at Data House. And we are a local consultancy who have been providing solutions for over 40 years now. But、um, from an Amazon perspective, we have been introduced and、uh, are a consulting select partner、um, for several years now. And so, we've been applying some of the technologies and solutions that Amazon provides、um, to some use cases that I'd like to share as well. So, one thing I wanted to start with、um, as we're talking about AWS Connect. Is to think about the, the ability to not just engage with your users, whether they're clients, partners, or even internal users.、Um, and it's just one mode of communication.、Uh, we talked about voice and its ability to pick up、um, speech to text. But even if you want to think about how you would engage with users, you, think, you can think about chatbots, <clears throat>、um, SMS, and email as far as text, all of which are unstructured data. So as, you, know, you can't think of how. A person would call or send you a text message or email you、um, as if they were filling out a form. So, AI is a one way of starting to turn that unstructured data into something that is structured that will allow you to、um, get new insights and adjust how you work and how you connect with people. <clears throat> something else to keep in mind is that、um, AWS Connect, especially,、uh, is allows you to be adaptive. It's a two way communication channel, it's not just one, not just a way for accepting transactions, but you could actually use it to communicate outbound. And by adaptive, what I mean is that you're able to set conditions. So, depending on time of day, depending on how much you know about the person who's contacting you, you can set conditions, and that can be either manually or you could actually adjust it to be、um, on certain times of day, things that you can actually adjust on the fly or can actually try to predict. Uh, thirdly, when you, when I, I mentioned about analyzing unstructured data, but、uh, something that people just don't have time to do is to be looking at all the, tran、um, the transcripts. So you saw how、uh, Adrian and Chris had shown you a transcript of a, of a voice session, but how many times are you going to be able to actually look at each of those, transcribe it, and look for keywords or hints that、uh, a caller was satisfied or getting impatient? 
um, all of that kind of sentiment analysis is not something that could really realistically be done uh, with a team, uh, especially folks who may have just started into a, a context center mode. Uh, and lastly, all of these things can be applied to really looking at what makes your business work better. So how can I establish customer efficiency? Um, sorry, how can I be more efficient at providing customer service? And how can I optimize away my workflows rather than spending time on, again, analysis, uh, trying to set up people who can take the calls or to have them interact with clients one-on-one. -on -one. Okay, so here are some of the use cases that we've actually heard about and we've actually helped some of our clients and partners uh, introduce. I've organized these in internal and external. Uh, internal would be how you would actually use AWS Connect for yourself um, to support your own staff or for your own uses. External would be more for how you would interact with the, the broader community. Uh, internally, we've actually had a couple of different opportunities to use AI. Um, one was would be just to even understand uh, if you have a help desk already, or if you have a contact center, uh, a way for someone to actually check in to see how did, what, what's the status of my ticket, or do I even have an open ticket <laughs> like, uh, available? Uh, you would actually be able to call in and find out when was the last time I called and is has that been resolved yet? Um, in case that person has not received a, a ticket that notified them that they were closed, they could actually call the help desk and find out you know what was the last status of that issue that I raised. Um, and for um, maybe not even an IT ticket. Uh, for another client, we actually have uh, a, a use case where we had a high volume of calls going into their uh, HR team, where their policies and procedures are often updated, and they have a very, um, I'll call it transient community. Um, they have projects, so a lot of times we will rotate in and out of them, and they need to know, oh, what is my, uh, what is the process for, for submitting expenses? Uh, what is the leave process? And actually, even going beyond that, what we were able to show them was an interactive chat or voice session that allowed a, a, an employee to check the leave balance to see how much uh, PTO do I have? Uh, when would be the next time I can actually take a full day off based on the accrual schedule? So by just digitizing some of the HR policies and procedures, and actually we used AI to, uh, to actually mine that just based on um, reading through all the actual documentation, um, it was actually able to interpret and make these calculations for people on the fly. Um, some other use cases that were very, you know, currently we're experiencing a lot of work from home. Uh, off and on, we're going to have office closures. And so one other use case that might be applied internally would be to set up AWS Connect to do company notifications. Um, emergency response uh, saying, if I know my staff are going to be calling in because they're going to check on whether the office is open, you could actually have a pre-recorded message that would have able to identify that it's a staff person, number one. And then um, through prompts, you could basically have that staff person check, oh, is this location going to be open if I, <laughs> or is it closed? Um, what is the current state of our emergency preparedness um, plan? So again this is not something that you would have necessarily always planned for but it's very easy to set up and so um, this is a way for uh, a company just to start adopting this type of, of, of AI uh, to use and to adopt into a company like immediately. <clears throat> so from an external standpoint um, these are going to sound familiar these are, are, are things that you probably experienced already but um, well, one thing that you might want to consider from an AWS Connect perspective is if you don't already have a call center, if you don't already have uh, a help desk, um, this is one way to stand it up. Or if you do have it, this could be a way to address a new need. If you have a new product, a new service that you're going to be rolling out and you haven't been able to like uh, go to your uh, contact team, your contact desk and tell them, hey, this is the new process for handling these types of calls you could actually stand this up as a way to, to route around that, to say, well, we don't have this existing, but we need a way to interact with our users now. So this would be a very quick and easy way to do that. Um, but say you do have a, a, an existing contact center, but you only staff it eight to five, Monday to Friday. Um, and now you're in, a, in a, a situation where you actually do have people who may call after hours, who are working from different locations and are in different time zones. I now need to scale out my ability to address those, those users, but now I, I only have one support number, but now I, can, I need to have more uh, staffing or instead of having that staffing, what if you were able to use that existing contact number and then use AWS Connect in order to extend your service hours beyond your eight to five? 
Uh, what it would be able to do is anticipate that if they're calling from this time zone and they know that it's after hours, then it's going to route it to a separate system, a different set of prompts that advise them of how they might be able to address this situation or just as a way to initially filter and triage that call before it wakes someone up at uh, 9 p.m. or that's pretty early sleep, <laughs> um, 3 a.m. call from a, a, a user who's out there on the East Coast. Um, this would be a way to supplement your existing team to address a, a sudden change in your operating environment without necessarily impacting it by having to scale out. Um, and of course, the, the last bullet I have there is, if you know that there's gonna be a sudden increase in amount, or you can anticipate it somehow, but you don't necessarily know how much, this would be a way for you to address that need, similar to after hours, um, but also in this case where if you already have an existing contact center, but you know this is an, uh, an interesting situation that you didn't necessarily anticipate, you could route certain calls to this, to this, this system instead of your, your existing team as just a way, again, to offset and supplement what you already have. Um, <clears throat> and thinking beyond AWS Connect, I did want to talk a little bit about AWS in general. Um, one of the reasons why we are a partner because when we see so much applicability in, uh, for our clients, for our teams, is that uh, AWS really is a global infrastructure. It is secure, it's scalable and flexible, and we have definitely needed that ability to go global. Uh, we have partners who are based in Asia. We needed to deploy some services to them, so we have, were able to stand up a, a service that is much more local to where they are, so the, the performance is fast. And meanwhile, we have another team in the East Coast. So how are you going to be able to establish the availability of your services across those, um, across those teams? Uh, the other thing that we see a lot of is are people migrating existing systems? And there are three that I've listed. There are actually six different patterns, they call them. But when you need to migrate a system or to put it into a different space because it's either getting old or because you need to use, get more new functions, you have the option to look at rehosting it. So just using AWS as infrastructure. Replatforming could take advantage of some of the scale that it has. So instead of using you know, multiple servers, you use, some, uh, you use templates to create additional capacity where you didn't before. Or to the end is a refactor where you basically rewrite the application or system so it can take advantage of all that the cloud has to offer. But that, again, assumes that you have an existing system that you want to migrate for one reason or another. Um, and one thing that I want to make sure that everyone kind of appreciates about AWS is it allows you to deploy faster, to move faster, to have a bias for action, to be able to do something, uh, not spend all your time doing the planning for something that you may not even have all the requirements for immediately, but to actually do something today, do something within this week, try something and try to see you know, where that takes you. Okay, and then some guidance or advice that we've picked up along the way working with AWS. Um, and especially because AWS itself is very much like a uh, wandering into a Home Depot, um, but you're not gonna go into Home Depot thinking I'm gonna build my house. You want to know, okay, well, what am I gonna focus on first before I um, decide to make work, before I make any decisions? And you need to put yourself in the position of knowing your business best. It's not what can you do, because with AWS, we found that you really can do almost anything. And the answer to, can I do this, is almost always going to be yes. But what you should do is really up to your business. It's a call that you would need to make based on your understanding of who you are, who you're trying to serve, and how you're going to do it. And so to always keep that business perspective um, and then hope, um, well, not even have to hope, you're going to know that there's going to be a technical component behind it that's going to work. So. Um, when you're thinking about how you're going to migrate, um, think about those factors about what you should do. But if you're not migrating, think about proof of concepts or pilots. And going back to the business objectives again, have someone in part of the team who represents the business side of it. So don't just, we're a very technical company, so I know our line of thinking is often, wow, let's just do this to see how cool it is. But um, you need to have someone who represents the business perspective to say, well, what are we trying to achieve? Is this really going to work for this? purpose and you know does this really solve our problem so don't forget to put in a uh, analyst a subject matter expert or someone who's a stakeholder on the business side to make sure you've defined your business objectives so you know what you're trying to achieve through your pilot or proof of concept and because you can deploy fast experiment fast fail fast but fixed fast so because you can do things in a very agile way to set up experiments test what happens and 
we don't necessarily mean fail as in everything goes to disaster or catastrophe, but it means that you're gonna learn something very quickly about how well this actually, um, this setup or this configuration works. And if it worked the way you want it to, great, keep going. And if not, fix it. And it allows you to fix fast or tear things down and start over again. So think small pilots, proof of concepts, uh, think of ways that you can drive the team with business objectives. Uh, finally, the last thing to consider is that you really need to um, understand that this is a consumption model and there are tiers. And so there is actually a free tier for almost every solution that AWS offers, which allows you to, again, experiment uh, without incurring any kinds of costs. So then there's a tier at which once you pass a certain threshold, you're going to be paying a certain amount. Uh, one thing I would advise is that people understand the pricing model. Um, you're usually dealing with um, fractions of pennies, so it doesn't seem like it could add up. But if you're starting to look at uh, 24 by 7 operations, if you do forget that you've started up this service and not turned it down at any point in time, it does add up. And because the scale of the cloud, one of the only things that can actually limit you or keep you from making a bad decision might be your finances. So understanding how it's priced, how you're consuming it, and even setting budgets ahead of time is a very good way to put in some guardrails to make sure you don't exceed, um, again, your business objectives, because you don't want this thing to be more expensive than you anticipated. Um, but that's um, <clears throat> all I wanted to go through. I know Adrian and Chris have some more lined up to share, but um, thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, unfortunately, I think um, we don't have time for Q&A right now, but if you guys would like to stay on a little bit, we can start the Q&A in two minutes after I do the close. I just wanna respect people's time if they need to leave. So if you wanna stay on for Q&A, please do. Um, if you can't, uh, we understand. But I wanted to thank everybody for joining us and thank you, Chris, Adrian, and Scott for sharing your solutions that can help us all improve customer service and our customer care centers. To close out, um, the session has been recorded and we'll share it with you um, after the event. If you opt to continue the conversation or you want to provide feedback, the link is over at the um, chat area. Um, we would really appreciate your input. Um, it's also an opportunity for you to continue this discussion. We have a box where you can tick off, oh, I wanna be part of a round table or I'd like to speak to um, one of the panelists. Um, just fill out the form and we will um, make that happen. I'd like to highlight upcoming true events um, that are coming up shortly. Uh, next week, ServeCo is going to share their customer service solution. Work from home has changed the way we interact with our customers. Peter Dewar and his team at ServeCo will share how they have a 360 degree view of their customers, from knowing their customers to data analytics to how to market to them. So look for that. Um, if you wanna get to know Adrienne a little bit better or hear about her career journey, We'll be featuring Adrienne in a Women in Technology series created by HTDC to highlight different roles in technology. True focuses on providing and sharing solutions. True is vendor agnostic, and we acknowledge that there's more than one way to solve a problem. Um, there are customer care solutions, including help desks, that two state agencies have put in place with Salesforce. They each have very different approaches. One started small and grew, and one started with a large strategic plan, um, but they both achieve their goal. If you're interested in learning more about these solutions or in learning more about how you can be involved with True, please go to hec.org slash true. And I forgot to share the screen so you can see it. Um, I look forward to more collaboration as we face multiple challenges from combating the pandemic to diversifying Hawaii's economy to accelerating adoption of technology and innovation as we make our organizations more productive and competitive. I wanted to thank you again for joining us today and for your continued support. And then I will take a peek to see how many people are still on and if there are a lot of people on, why don't we go ahead and move to our Q&A section. Can I invite the panelists to come back? Hi, Michelle. Hello. <laughs> we have a lot of questions for you guys. You ready? <laughs> We're ready. <laughs> we'll do our best. <laughs> okay. First question. When you say it's free, is it really free or was it only during the development phase and experimental use cases? Yeah, so 
you know what it's it's really free and so we did not pay anything um to amazon connect and really all that we're paying is our permanent use charges um for the phone lines and you know the phone lines you get it directly from amazon and they have um, you know, uh, just a, a lot of numbers already reserved and in their services available for all different area codes. And so, um, you know, and, and that's really what we're paying. You're paying monthly for your usage and that's it. Um, but we are not paying for any of the AI or um, any of the features and functionalities that come with um, Amazon Connect. Okay, and then Scott, you mentioned that we had to um, consider the cost model. Do you want to share anything there? Uh, maybe not particularly with Connect. Um, a, lot, mm -hmm. a lot of the prices are actually going to be, um, if you have low volume especially, it does fall within a free tier. Mm -hmm. um, but if you do know that at, at one point after your experiment or your proof of concept, you're going to actually use this ongoing and potentially throw more volume at it, you should know what you're getting into. Um, so it's good to know all the services and how they might start accruing charges. And there are great uh, tools within Amazon to help with your budgeting that you can actually use those to budget out, plan what your volume is, and you can actually project your, your costs. And, and if you are looking at doing a complex solution, whether it's in the contact center or elsewhere, Amazon does a great job of helping fund those. So you can actually work with your, uh, with your partner, whether it's us or data house or someone else, and we can work to get you uh, funding through Amazon to basically pay or a proof of concept if it's definitely going to be complex. Got it. And then is there a limit to the volume of calls that can be handled? Well, nothing is uh, infinite, but you know, if you built out a traditional <laughs> call center, one of the things that you know is you have to get, uh, whether you're going ISDN or PRI, you need channels coming in and whatever you buy, you're either buying too much that it sits empty or it sits idle a lot of the time, or you're not buying enough and you actually have busy signals at times. And also the same for your uh, infrastructure. You, whatever you buy for your agents, some agents you're gonna seat, your licenses, that's all predetermined up front and it's not very flexible. With uh, Connect, it's almost limitless. Um, you're not gonna build a call center to, to put on there. I mean, Amazon alone seats over 80,000 concurrent agents uh, every day. And that's just one component, that one use case of the being on Amazon Connect. You know, there are tens of thousands of agents. You could add a thousand agents tomorrow, wouldn't impact uh, Amazon Connect at all and you could start taking that volume immediately by just deploying a simple call center. Great, and Adrian, you increased the number of people handling your calls during your project, right? Yeah, we did. So on our existing on-premise platform, um, we had or could only accommodate um, you know, five agents within our IT tech support help desk. So a lot of our first call um, resolution, our rates, our first call resolutions were very poor. And, um, and a lot of it was because, you know, we had just, you know, not very skilled technical um, agents, you know, manning the, the first calls um, as they came through our support center. Once we deployed Amazon Connect, you know, to Chris, Chris's point and to Scott's point, um, it, it's, you know, so the platform was so flexible that we were able to add on all of our tech support teams. And so our users now have the ability to talk straight to a tech instead of, you know, um, layered. And so, um, you know, we've gotten a lot of positive comments that they can get to um, a technician very quickly because, you know, they're out there, they're, they're growing the business, you know, they're working hard and they need help. And, and I think they appreciated that change um, to be able to just get directly to an engineer. Got it. Thank you. So we went, yeah. So, so Michelle, we went from five to 17 in, in a day. <laughs> That's a wild. Uh, Nikki has a great question. Does call sentiment work with Pigeon? <laughs> Gold star. Anyone who can answer that one? <laughs> no, it does not. Um, you know, what's that combining? Isn't it the combination of Chinese and English? I believe. <laughs> uh, so right now, uh, contact lens is available in English and Spanish, and it's specifically English. It calls out uh, U.S. English, U.K. English, Australian, and Indian. Uh, they will be adding uh, more languages throughout the, the year. You know, it is a new service. It came on uh, on general availability, gosh, I want to say in the middle of the summer. And Adrian had been whitelisted for it and was testing it out just before it got released and uh, was on it uh, already when it went available to the public. So it is 
very, very new. And that's one of the great things with Amazon. They're always developing their products. Sometimes they'll put them out and it's not exactly what you want. It will get there. And I think over 90% of the features you see in Amazon services come from requests from customers. So they, Amazon know. listens. They are customer obsessed and they listen. Got it. Hey, hey Michelle, I just wanted yeah. to share a funny story. You know, you talk about, you asked about Pigeon and we actually tested it. We played I was going to say, we should test it. it. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, it was the sentiment results were all red. <laughs> it <was not> <laughs> So, so I didn't get a very good score on that call. <laughs> <laughs> good to know. Um, I just thought I'd share that. <laughs> I was gonna, that. My next thing was, let's test it out. <laughs> <laughs> so does, does the customer provide feedback post-call? And if so, what's the overall feedback of the customer experience? Yeah, so we haven't um, we haven't built out the automated customer survey yet. Um, we we have yet to get there. Um, so right now we're not doing uh, customer feedback um, because you know we're just right now in the mm -hmm. internal um, de deployment. We do reach out. I'll go through um, some of the uh, call recordings and I'll reach out to some of our users just to say, you know, hey, how was your experience? And um, you know, we get a lot of good feedback um, mm -hmm. from our employees. So. And we take that to heart and we make sure that we put that in our notes and we make sure that we, you know, we address that as we go to the next employment deployment. But, you know, we're, we, we're looking forward to getting there. Um, and, you know, hopefully that soon. We just launched Chatbot um, last week. In fact, we just activated Chatbot for our internal mm -hmm. support help desk. And so we're pretty excited about that. And we're doing a lot of API integration to a database right now to help uh, do all of the easy, um, you know, routine tasks. Um, and one of the areas that, you know, we're looking for AI to take, um, to take control is in our password reset. And so process, which is, gosh, almost uh, internally for IT support help desk is probably about 70% of our calls. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. This is a, a little bit of a tougher question and I'm sure it's, it's unique to each individual organization. But were jobs eliminated? I think one of the fears of AI and RPA is that, you know, we eliminate jobs. Have you seen that? And then how were employees impacted positively and negatively? You know, for us, there were no job eliminations. Um, and, you know, really, when you talk about AI, you know, um, AI is there to enhance the customer experience. It is not there to replace the human interaction. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, it's about making manual processes or mundane processes more efficient so that we can take our agents and put them into areas that we can help to grow the business. And so, no, absolutely not. Um, you know, and, and I think if you read a lot about AI in call centers, um, you will see that, that one of the themes is that AI is not um, by any means the answer to cost reduction in terms of headcount. Right. But it's more to augment and, and help the experience and help the agents. Yep. And I've heard people share that um, because everyone is so inundated with work, that if yeah. AI and RPA can help, then people are um, redirected to either sales generating, you know, businesses or jobs or, or tasks. Right. No, that's and I think, point. you know, I think it's important, you know, our agents are so experienced and they have so much information to share. And if we can just give them the time to be able to, you know, to, to offer some, some help in terms of how we can improve um, processes, you know, they're so inundated today with just all of their time and energy is just spent on, on, you know, servicing the customer. But a lot of them, if you get a chance to sit down and talk with them, they have a lot of good information that they can help in delivering, um, you know, a great experience, um, you know, but I got to tell you, our, our agents, even in our, our external contact center, they work hard and, um, you know, they are tired. They are tired. By the end of the day, they are tired and we've got to fix that. Yep. No, I think that's great. And the people <laughs> with the experience are able to help these systems come to exactly. fruition, right? That's Is right. That that's right. 
Yeah. Is there an optim optimal size, optimal minimal size for the technology to be economically feasible? I'm thinking of smaller companies, for example. You know, well, I would say, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Adrian. Go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. I was going to say, like, for a smaller company, I mean, this is the ideal way to deploy a contact center. That uh, you do not have to have a capital expenditure to purchase li uh, hardware licenses or anything. I mean, and you don't have to spend them really the money for people to engineer it. Um, you can work with a consultant relatively quickly. And, you know, I saw one of the questions in there, how quickly can you set up a, uh, something like this? You could sit with someone in a basic call center and have it up in a matter of hours. And the more of the questions are going to be here, how do you want to word things? And what do you want to have answered first? I mean, it can be done that quickly. The interface is very yeah. simple for the agents. The reporting tool is very simple. Mm -hmm. um, for a small company, this is a great way to go. And it doesn't mean, by the way, this is for small companies mm -hmm. because you can uh, see thousands of agents on this and make it a very, very complex environment to serve any uh, co contact center needs. Okay. Scott, anything to add in Hawaii here? Well, no, I was going to say the same thing as far as you don't usually start with a call center in mind when you start building something, a service okay. or product. So this is a way, and I, I've seen even when you want to publish an app, on the apps in the app store, you need a number uh, or you would need to provide a number. And this would actually be easier to get a number through AWS Connect than they actually register one through like a, uh, <laughs> it's faster to do That's it this right. way. Yeah. Okay. And then Darren has a follow-up question to how many calls. He's talking about 7 million calls. <laughs> um, <laughs> how workable is that? Most of that during, you know, business hours, but maybe Darren, I can, um, allow you to share a little bit more? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Great, uh, well, I've been working with a state agency and I'm in Texas uh, and they have a call center and they are limited in the number of people that, you know, I guess the state legislature limits state agency head counts. And so you can only assign a certain number of people to this function and they are essentially overwhelmed. And so with 7 million calls, the, the, the solution might be a call center with a chat box that can address most people's questions without human intervention. Uh, you know, 7 million calls is out of bounds. And so they can't answer all the calls and people give up. And then uh, they go to a physical site and then they overwhelm that site. And so it's like, uh, as, as in a, an office, not a, not a website. So uh, I'm just trying to think if this is a good solution for that kind of a problem. Well, that sounds familiar. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Scott or Chris? Take a stab. Um, actually, it, it, it definitely could. And one thing that you would want to consider is that not everyone is calling with the same issue at once. Um, if you can at least categorize the types of issues and set up like a detour to say that I'm going to publish this con this contact number and this chat function in order to address these types of issues, that would be one way of stemming the flow. Um, again, it, it, I don't know if it's 7 million is like a consistent thing all the time or if it's just because of the surge of you know, activities these days. But yeah, that would be one way of trying to at least address that type of volume is to categorize how the callers are going and potentially routing um, certain types of issues a different way. Great, thank you, Scott. Okay, and thank you, Darren. Um, another question, how does AWS have a beta environment where you test the flow before it goes live? How does that work? Well, you can set up a, a contact flow and have it not even in production. You can keep, uh, have it set up so you just have one test number that you send to it and not your live environment. And you could flip flop the, the number that points to it at any point that you've tested it and feel it's ready for uh, your customers. So it's not really a sandbox per se, it's how you use it. Um, and the flexibility for you to actually make changes, everything is literally instantaneous. So you can test it and then flip it to production when you're ready. And then if you have those changes and you wish to then expand on those in the future, it's simple to export all the work you've done and created a new uh, contact flow and now update it and get ready, test it again and do it all over again. So it's very, very easy to work with. Great, thank you. 
And maybe this will be our last question. Um, can this be integrated with sales and marketing applications? Or maybe you can share a um, example because the answer is probably yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. <laughs> Chris Absolutely. or Scott, you guys, yeah. Yeah, there, actually a lot of what the AWS Connect integrates on or it's best to integrate with is if you have an existing customer relationship management system. That's a good way of identifying who your, con your, your contacts are. So if they're coming in, you already know potentially what issue they might be reporting or what they actually want. Um, so interestingly enough, uh, someone actually about, uh, asked about call volume. There is a limit to how many outbound calls you would make or outbound messages it's because AWS does not want you to abuse this to become a spammer. Um, so there are actually coded limits. Oh. In so inbound, I don't think you'll ever have a problem addressing the inbound, but from the sales and marketing perspective, if you do want to send you know, email blasts or calls, that will be monitored um, mm -hmm. a little bit more. And you can actually increase the thresholds, but they do that in order to protect um, the public. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's great. Oh, I wanted to thank you all again. I think that this has been a, a great session and informative. Um, thank you for being so giving. Um, for everyone who's still on the line, everything will be on the website for share, um, including the flows and the roadmap and, and all the slides. So please check back there and then the recordings will be available shortly as well. Thank you guys very sincerely. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks, Thanks Michelle. Scott. Thanks, Adrian. Thanks, Scott. Okay, take care. Stay safe. Stay safe, everyone. Okay, bye. Uh. <laughs>